I finally get in touch with you and uh, all the uh, persistence it paid off to have you on, man. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, Chris, I wanted to get it all started with. Uh, how did you get involved with football as a kid? Well, my uh, oldest, my two oldest brothers played football, football, basketball, and baseball, and stuff like that. So <clears throat> I just got started because I wanted to hang around with them. I didn't want to be the only boy in the house. I'm the youngest of five, so I didn't want to be in the house with my uh, two other sisters. So every time they went out and played or went to their sport, I went with them. Definitely, man. So uh, growing up, who were some of your sports role models that you looked up to? Well, being from Louisville, uh, the first and foremost sports model was uh, Muhammad Ali. You know, yeah, um, man. Sting not, like a butterfly, floating. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah, so, sting like a bee, float like a butterfly. Right. So not having him there from Louisville and, uh, and always uh, not that far away from him, I, I don't live that far away from him. He's probably was my biggest role model of growing up. Heck yeah, man. So uh, scrolling it forward for you uh, in your football journey, how did Purdue come around for you? And what was their pitch to get you to come play football for him? Well, um, Coach Chester Caddis was uh, recruiting me at the time. Him and uh, uh, Mike Holloway, who was from uh, Louisville, they both was recruiting me at the time. Um, you know, I was going to Indiana. My dad graduated from uh, IU. I was actually going to go to IU until Lee Corso got fired. Then once Lee Corso got fired, I um, switched my pattern to go to uh, Purdue. Even though I was going to try to go to Michigan, Purdue was probably the closest Big Ten school. I always wanted to play in the Big Ten. And Purdue was probably the closest Big Ten school where I knew my mom and dad and our clunker of a car could make it. I hear you, man. Hey, we, we, we all go through those moments, man. <laughs> I've had my fair share of clunkers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, what else were, were some of their pitches to you to come play for them? Well, of course, being close. I'm a, I'm a parent's boy. Of course, been close to home. Um, was only three hours away. That was a huge pitch for me. Uh, just being able to play in a Big Ten. And, well, they pitched me that, well, I was going to play receiver. So <laughs> <laughs> then when I got there, they switched from the defensive back. So that was a that was a, one of those banana in the tailpipe uh, switches. But I'm glad they did that. Definitely, man. It led you to the NFL. So right. uh, leading up to the NFL draft for you, were there uh, any uh, certainties on where you would land in the draft? And what teams were trying to connect with you to say, yes, we're going to draft you? Not that many, you know, um, not that many at all, because I, mean, I was a fifth round draft choice, 125th pick in the, in the fifth round. So I just wanted to get drafted. You know, I wasn't in my draft party. It was a big party of three. My dad was back there sleeping. My mom and I was watching Andy Griffin stories. So, oh, Andy Griffin <laughs> uh, show. So, draft my draft day wasn't in New York. It wasn't the hula it is right now. It was just a draft party of three. We were sitting in my apartment at West Lafayette, Indiana, and waiting on that phone call. And then once that phone call finally came from Mike Hollaback, uh, God rest his soul, from the Houston Oilers, you know, the only thing I knew about Houston was George Foreman. And I didn't like nothing about Houston because of George Foreman. I was such a big Muhammad Ali uh, fan uh, that I didn't even – I was like, Houston. But it, it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to getting drafted by the Oilers because then I was able to connect with a guy named Nick Saban, who was my DB coach, and um, Coach Jerry Glanville, who played the same style of defense that – we did at Purdue was the bump and run. So it actually helped me out very, very, very good. Heck yeah, man. So uh, scrolling it forward for you, heading into your third season with the Oilers, how fueled up were you to produce and go in there and pr prove yourself to that organization that gave you an opportunity? Well, my, my rookie year, you know, like I said, through training camp and everything else that um, – 
I ended up I ended up playing some games. Um, played in a lot of games. I played in the nickel. I played in a lot of games. I was the third corner coming in and playing. You know, uh, my rookie year and also my uh, my other years. So being able to, I just told myself that year that it's time for me to play. It's time for me to get on the field. And Coach Glanville and everyone had so much confidence in me to get on the field. So uh, things worked out where I was able to get on the field and play. And just, like I said, once I get on, I might get off. Definitely, man. So up to that point in your NFL journey, who was the toughest cover for you? Who gave you troubles? <laughs> well, I have to I have to say Wesley uh, Walker because he beat me for two touchdowns my rookie year there and uh, up there with the Jets. So I think he was probably the toughest one that I had to cover. But going on, you know, the, the, the toughest receiver that I probably had faced throughout my career probably was Michael Irvin. You know, everybody's like, well, he's not that fast. He's not that this. But he was very strong at the point of attack. You know, he's so competitive. He's, you know, when, once he get the ball in his hand, he turned into a running back. So, but it was, it was back then, there was so many great receivers each and every week that you had to face. Uh, Andre Risen, Andre Reed, you know, Jerry Rice, John Taylor, you know, uh, Al Toon. It was so many, so many good receivers back then that you had to face each and every week that you had to stay ready. Definitely, man. So uh, scrolling it forward, life after football for you, Chris, how have you applied the trials and tribulations of the game to your personal life? Well, just yes, keep, keep going. First and foremost, that you have to have faith in God that he, he has you on and off the field, spiritually, mentally, that he has you and that you just wake up every morning and thank God. I wake up every morning and thank God and whatever life has for me, he has already, God has already came for me anyway to clear up my path. So I just attribute everything to just keep moving forward. And whatever happens, happens. Because you only can control what you can control. If I get up every morning and control what I can control, then life is great. You know. Definitely, man. So uh, my next two questions for you, the two-time Pro Bowler, are brought to you by B&D Sports Media. What are your thoughts on your former team, the Washington Commanders? What do you think about that name, man? What's your <laughs> thoughts on it? Well, you know, I, I, I kind of like it. It's gonna be hard for me. It's gonna be hard for me to keep to switch from the Redskins to the Commanders, but uh, that's their name right now, the Commanders. And you know, it, it, it's gonna grow on you. Of course, people don't like change, and people, oh, it's this, that could have been this. You can't please everyone. I think they have smarter people in that organization than me that probably pull that um, name and see if that will stick with the people in Washington, you know, because the Washington, Washington commanders have such a great fan base. Their fans are in tune in everything that goes on with that organization, which is great. So it's going to take a while to, to, um, to let us sink into people, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it was the right thing to do. Definitely, man. So uh, my next question is for your other team that you played for, Houston. Will Davis Mills be their answer at quarterback long term? And I'll give you your floor, your chance to answer, and I'll, I'll chime in. Well, that I can't answer because um, I don't really follow them like that anymore. So it's going to be hard for me to say something on someone I don't even follow. Like right now, you just mentioned the name David Mills. Davis uh, Mills. Davis Mills. I'm assuming he's a quarterback. I don't even yeah. know where he's from. So, you know, I don't, I don't really follow that anymore. I follow players more now than I do teams, if that makes sense. He played you at know. Stanford. Oh, well. But I know Coach Shaw there is a great coach. So if he played at Stanford, then he got some NFL coaching. Because Coach Shaw is a very good coach. Like I said, I follow players. You know, I follow Xavier Howard. You know, he's one of the guys I coached there at Baylor. So I don't really follow I like this team or that team. Now, what I, do, what I can say right now that I think the Dolphins 
did the one of the smartest things I've seen a team ever do. They brought about, back two other uh, all pro corners to coach the defensive back. You know, you cannot have enough experience that were sustained and those guys back there coaching their defensive backs. You know, just imagine if you go down every team and bring back one of the all pros or one of the legends to actually coach that position, how much better that position can be. Because coaching is not just what you see. Coaches is X and O's, but coaching is not just the X and O's part of it. Coaching is when a player is there 10 to 15 minutes before the meeting and you there talking to them about different stuff that ha happens when you play. Coaching is when you're walking off the field with the guy and be able to give him little tidbits of watching your feet, the hands getting too wide, move your feet when you impress, open your eye, try to have the internal clock in your head when you get to the three seconds. So coaching is those little tidbits that those guys will be able to give those players that uh, you won't see on Sunday. Well, you will see it on Sunday, but someone told them how to do it. Definitely, man. I think it, another thing with that is just winning trust, trust to uh, do the right thing on the uh, right situations. That and with the Davis Mills question, I think that's uh, Watson's job, to be honest, with Houston. Whenever his legal situation gets all squared away, well, like I said, I don't, I don't, I can't speak on that. But I don't have knowledge. Excuse me, I don't have knowledge to speak on that of the Watson situation. I don't have knowledge of that. Yes, I know about it. I'd be crazy to say I don't know about it. Yes, I know about it. But like I said, I, I pray for him. I hope he get himself that situation straight. And if if the Houston Texans have to play someone, the Houston Texans don't play the Houston Texans. So wherever he lands. I hope he get himself into that position and be able to, and be able to prosper. Definitely, he he has a, a, had talent and everything under the sun, and that goes to show you one bad mistake or a couple of bad mistakes can really cost you your career and your future. It, yes, if you do, but like I said, I don't I don't want to speak on that because I don't sure. I don't know if he's guilty or not guilty. I know he has not been arrested i know it's, it's all allegations right now for sure i know he has not been charged with anything so you know you, you're innocent until until proven guilty that's why you have the court of law definitely besides uh howard from the dolphins what other players do uh do you follow still tavon campbell i follow him there with, with the Chargers. there's another guy there's, I pretty follow my players that I've coached or, or I've known, you know, I follow him a lot. Uh, so I'm glad to see that some of the guys is, is actually doing pretty good. They're in, in the league. So this is different guys I follow in the league that, that I have coached. I know. Definitely. Well, Chris, we'll end on this. Where can my audience find you on social media? Just go to a chrisdishman.com. Um, and check me out. I'm mostly on, you know, just that's my website, and they have all my social media stuff and everything I'm doing right now. You know, Change Our Numbers is, a, is, is an organization that I'm working with as far as my charitable organization is Change Our Numbers. It's an organization that I'm working with as far as changing the numbers of, of yourself. So if you can go on there and check that out also, it would be greatly appreciated. Blessings, Chris. It's been a a wonderful uh, time speaking with you and uh, welcome you back for another one, my friend.